The United States calls for a new course on China-U.S. trade relations, with talks between both sides expected to resume soon. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu, and this is The Heat. The hardline approach that the U.S. has adopted towards China on trade relations doesn't look like it will change much anytime soon. United States Trade Representative Catherine Tai outlined the latest approach from the Biden administration during comments delivered at a Washington think tank on Monday. And although she said she plans to have talks soon with Chinese officials, she also insisted China needs to comply with the phase one trade deal that both sides signed, uh, signed up to last year. But our analysis indicates that while commitments in certain areas have been met, that certain business interests have seen benefits, there have also been shortfalls in others. But the reality is this agreement did not meaningfully address the fundamental concerns that we have with China's trade practices. Later in the show, I will also talk with author and historian Bu Srinivasan on the Biden economic agenda that is now stalled in Congress. But we begin with China-U.S. trade relations. Joining us now from Beijing is Aina Tangen. He is a political and economic affairs commentator. Also with us here in Washington, D.C., is Jeff Moon. He served as assistant U.S. trade representative for China during the Obama administration. And joining us, too, from Portland, Oregon, is Yan Liang. She is a professor of economics at Willamette University. Welcome to all of you. And Anna Tang, let me start with you. The U.S. Trade Representative, Catherine Tai, accused China of failing to meet its commitments that were made in phase one of this trade deal, um, according to a think tank here in Washington that keeps track of these things. Um, it says that China will fall short by more than 30 percent of the uh, commitments that it made to buy American goods. Uh, what's your response to the comments that she made? And it does appear that this is a continuation of Trump's policies. Uh, yes, uh, that's quite clear. But uh, the real issue here, and that people should be paying attention to, is that for the first time, uh, a U.S. administration it says that China, they don't anticipate that China will change. And that means that they're accepting this. Uh, previously, it had all been about how you can bludgeon China into being exactly like the U.S., and that is now kind of under the table. So this, all this tough talk, uh, it sounds very uh, good. It's a continuation uh, from the U.S. perspective, continuation of Trump policies. But you know, keep this in mind. Right now, the uh, deficits uh, right you know, for the U.S. with China is about $300 billion. Um, right now, China is about 62 percent of that $200 billion. Uh, you can add it up. It is not going to make a dent uh, appreciably uh, in terms of what the ongoing deficit is going to be at the end of this year, this trade deficit. So, Aina, the tough talk that you referred to, that may have been directed at a domestic audience, but do you see serious negotiations to resolve this dispute beginning pretty soon? Well, you know, when you start talking about serious re, uh, negotiations, you're always talking about how you can solve the problem. And what I'm trying to point out is that even if they uh, got full compliance on phase one, uh, they would not be addressing the underlying issue here, which Donald Trump was trying to uh, put forward, is that he could somehow uh, create uh, circumstances where the U.S. Uh, trade deficit with China disappeared. It has not only not disappeared, it has grown significantly uh, over these past few years. Uh, the deficit is higher today, much higher by a huge factor, than when it was uh, when Donald Trump entered office. So that should give you an idea about uh, you know, uh, the effectiveness of his approach and the fact that you cannot uh, continue a bad policy and expect it to create a good solution. Jeff Moon, what are your thoughts on that, uh, that the core issues are not being addressed here? Well, I felt all along that the core issues weren't being addressed. I felt that the uh, tariffs were not going to solve the problem. But uh, Biden has inherited a situation where we do have a phase one deal. China has made commitments. Uh, we can count them numerically, and China has not made uh, you know, met, met its commitments. And so that would be a problem. And Catherine Tai has said that's the first thing 
that she would like to discuss when uh, she and her Chinese counterpart get together. That's entirely understandable. She said she wanted to do four things. First of all, talk about that. Second, she wanted to initiate a domestic exclusion process that, that stopped after the Trump administration. Um, she wants to then talk about what we used to call the phase two issues, industrial policies. Mm -hmm. And then all along, she wants to be working with America's allies. To a certain extent, a lot of what she said is old wine in new bottles. Mm -hmm. uh, so re many, there are many restatements of principles that the Biden administration has already made. The framework is going to be similar. But she said she wanted to use new tools and new initiatives, but she did not specify exactly what those might be. And there is a new emphasis, as there has been throughout the Biden administration, on working together with allies. And those tools and initiatives may have something to do with allies as well. Right, Jeff, just one point on that uh, purchasing shortfall. The Chinese response has been that, look, yes, that phase one deal was signed, but nobody expected there to be a COVID-19 pandemic, and that has affected demand uh, in China. Well, I can cite many, many articles in the Chinese press about how trade is surging um, from China. So uh, I don't know. I think that might be something that Catherine Tai and her counterpart will want to talk about. But I don't necessarily accept the argument that COVID has prevented China from meeting its purchase agreements. For example, uh, just this week, the Secretary of Commerce was talking about how China is holding back on buying many airplanes, mm. which would help bridge that gap. And I suspect that China is using that as a bargaining chip um, as we start talking about how to meet those purchase commitments. All right, let me bring uh, Yang Liang into the conversation. Yang Liang, Catherine Tai also accused China of failing to adhere to global trading norms. And she said China's plans, the plans that we know about right now, do not call for meaningful reform. Um, what do you make of that? Right. So I think it's very interesting, and I agree with the previous two speakers, that, you know, she didn't really articulate any sort of strategic uh, or new plan. Um, so mostly they're keeping the tariffs, which um, has been widely criticized, uh, even by Biden's own cabinet, most vocally by Janet Yellen, um, how this tariff is undercutting the U.S.'s business and workers and consumers' bottom line. Um, then I think, you know, for her, um, going back to the, the point that you guys were talking about, which is this purchase agreement, I think she herself even downplayed the significance of that purchase agreement. I think the most important and the most critical, um, you know, sticking point between the two countries is the industrial policy, is what she called the state-centered, um, unfair sort of trade practices. Um, but again, I think, you know, different countries run their economy differently, and it's obvious that, you know, China has a different economic system. Um, not to mention, I would add, that the U.S. is simply also um, trying to do many of the things that China has been doing, like infrastructure investment, um, like a strong state support in technology, right? Let's not forget the U.S. just passed the uh, U.S. In in Innovation and Competition Act, um, which provided state funding of $110 billion over five years to support the advanced and basic research in some of the tech, uh, you know, leading edge technologies. Um, and also when it comes to subsidies, I think, you know, that is one of the disputes between the Air, um, Airbus and Boeing uh, dispute. So I just wanted to sort of make the point that um, it's clear that Catherine Tai understand that, you know, China may not change its own economic practices because that's the sovereignty issue and that is China's you know, um, you know, the critical ingredients to its economic success. And yet, at the same time, I think she has been talking about the new tools, which, again, we have heard this um, in March when she's sworn in, but nothing really concrete. Um, and not to mention, you know, working with allies, I think it's easier said than done, um, given, you know, um, I think there was a question in the audience about trade diversion, and I don't think that she really answered that question, which is, you know, when the U.S. pushed China to buy more from the United States, how does this do to um, U.S.'s traditional allies like in EU? Um, and also, we can talk about the, you know, steel aluminum tariffs, and we'll talk about, you know, the recent um, you know, upsetting um, the French uh, with the submarine um, deals with Australia on, and so on and so forth. So, again, I think what is disappointing is that, you know, the new administration, I mean, the Biden administration is still inheriting um, the Trump's uh, approach, which is clearly counterproductive and yet still having no concrete plan going forward. Anna Tangan, when it comes to trade tariffs, Catherine Tai also said that, look, 
the United States is looking at the possibility of unwinding some of those uh, tariffs right now. But what is your sense of what will happen with the tariffs uh, in the next round of talks? Well, uh, absolutely nothing. I mean, this is this is all political, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it's only politically motivated. She wants to talk tough and sound like uh, she's going to be uh, the, the hard, hard person on China. Uh, the facts are what they are. I mean, it, it's I keep saying, and Jeff Moon did not uh, address, is this issue that, um, you know, the U.S. is in deficit. It continues to need goods from the global supply chain. That is not going to change. And this idea that somehow, um, you know, everything is normal during COVID and that China should be buying Boeing airplanes when no one else is, I mean, this is, contradicts everything that I know about a free market, the idea that one country can force another country to buy goods it doesn't need and no one else is buying simply because of this uh, agreement uh, in place. Uh, the agreement was based on economic conditions. Remember, this agreement was put together before COVID-19. No one anticipated. Everything has changed. And this idea that, uh, you know, China should just pony up and take its medicine, it's nonsense. Um, you know, All right, let China's me... that's the problem. Yeah, let me get Jeff's response to that. What other point, Jeff? Uh, the Biden administration is under pressure right now from U.S. businesses. Uh, who say that they're coming under pressure as far as supply chains are concerned, and also the, which is affecting the availability of goods here, as well as prices. Right. Well, there are about a dozen issues that I've heard in here. Let me just take one or two of them. Um, first of all, no one is suggesting China, force China to take any medicine. The only suggestion here is that China live up to agreements that it made itself. I share Einar's pessimism about the ability to reach an agreement for political reasons. I don't think anything will happen until the end of next year when Xi Jinping gets reelected and the U.S. congressional elections are completed. The bilateral engagements that have occurred thus far have been so confrontational and, and the comments have been so focused on the domestic audiences that I don't think that the leaders are currently capable of bridging their differences internationally to reach an agreement. Um, you mentioned the tariffs. Mm -hmm. And what interests me is that there is so much interest from Chinese officials and Chinese media in getting rid of those tariffs. That suggests to me that the punitive effect that Trump intended is actually happening. In addition, there is a punitive effect on American business that has been well documented by trade associations and other business interests. And the reason that those tariffs have not been lifted is that there are economic and political realities. Mm -hmm. The economic reality is that those tariffs bite and were probably not wise. Mm -hmm. The political reality in the United States is that there is an overwhelming right. consensus that has developed to get tough on China, and that's just not going away. That's going to be there at least until the end of next year. Yang Liang, there was something else that Catherine Tai said uh, in that address this morning, and that was that China's growth, she said, is coming at the expense uh, of workers and economic opportunity in the United States, uh, and, and I'm quoting her here, and other market-based democratic economies, unquote. Right. I think, you know, she's really still looking at this at a sort of zero-sum game. And I want to go back to Jeff's comment momentarily um, ago um, that this trade war produces losses for China. Well, I mean, that's a moot point. Um, tariff war is a lose-lose um, sort of scenario. So it's really a moot point to say who suffers more than others. The point is to what end, right? If the, the, if the point is to address trade imbalances, if the point is to, um, you know, force China to to adopt any sort of regime change or, you know, uh, economic system change, that clearly has failed. And so I think the point here is to, for those countries, for both countries, um, to really to talk about collaborations, economic cooperations, and how to make trade work for both, um, how to find that common interest. And I just want to add one point on that trade imbalances. I think as China now fighting climate change, as China now, you know, climb up the technological ladder and trying to engage in the so-called intelligent uh, manufacturing, I do see the possibility, right, for these trade balance the imbalances to be reduced. Um, China used, you know, over um, two thirds of its energy um, on industrial production, and only 30 some percent of energy consumption goes to services and residential uses. 
and that is clearly unsustainable, and it's not really in favor uh, in the favor of, of China itself. So I think going forward, as China you know grows and its um, income level rises, and it's more conscious about how to effectively use this energy, um, I do see that China is possible to embrace more imports and you know redress that trade imbalances. Again, I think the sticking point is really how each country is going to manage if uh, manages its own economy. Uh, Ty talked about smart and resilient, uh, you know, supply chain. So it's clear that there are certain industries, there are certain, you know, jobs that um, she wants to right. see grow, right? But I think, again, there's a lot of political barriers and um, political power play yep. in it. And I've only got 15 seconds. Where do you see this going uh, in the next few months? Uh, it's not going anywhere. I agree with Jeff that uh, it's all after the elections, but I don't agree that you can conflate uh, that she will be the leader with the uncertainties that are uh, present now in the uh, midterm elections. Okay. Ina Tangan, Jeff Moon, Yang Liang, thanks to all of you for being with us. We turn now to the challenges facing the Biden administration as the president tries to get major funding approved by the U.S. Congress. I talked earlier with author and historian Boo Srinivasan. His book is titled Americana, a 400-year history of American capitalism. Boo, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. As we just heard, trade tensions between China and the United States continue. Those trade tariffs that were put in place by the former administration of Donald Trump are still in place. Uh, but now we're hearing that there are supply chain problems in the United States and they're getting worse. Uh, prices for goods are hitting U.S. consumers very badly. President Biden is also under pressure uh, from businesses uh, to come up with some kind of coherent straight trade policy with regards to China. How important is it for these two countries, these are two of the world's biggest economies, to resolve these differences soon? Because it does impact the globe. Important, but at the same time, I think there's... Um you know, I don't think there's any great rush to do it at a time when we're just recovering from a post-pandemic economy. I think to some degree it needs to be looked at holistically. And businesses that are impacted by tariffs are always going to put pressure. And there are other businesses um, that are beneficiaries, certainly. You know, historically, businesses at the, uh, during the McKinley era used to be very pro-tariff. And in fact, until the, the advent of the income tax in the United States, businesses were generally very, very pro-tariff because it helped domestic producers and it harmed uh, importers. So now that's changed, obviously, because of, as you pointed out, supply chains are linked. And so you have US businesses and Chinese suppliers um, are, are both a part of the same supply chain. So that's a, a di bit of a distinction. But I do think that this shock overall, to some degree, has been a good thing, the supply shock in the United States, that how reliant we are on countries like China to supply us with our most basic goods. You know, if for the first six weeks or so during the pandemic, we were out of masks. So I do think that that shock needs to be addressed as well. And I think merely to put a quick mandate over, uh, over these things right now, because there's some inflationary pressures, I think is a mistake. All right, let's move uh, to the stalemate in the United States Congress right now. Congress is considering two multi-trillion dollar bills. If we look at the details on these bills, they provide money for infrastructure, money to combat climate change, money for Medicare, child care, education, among other things. There's a lot of other provisions in there. Uh, this would seem to help the ordinary American, working class Americans. So why is it such a hard job to sell this to the Republicans? Well, one, it's a very, very large price tag. But secondly, I think that what you have are two uh, parties that basically speak in sound bites. And this has been happening for quite some time now, and it's much easier to think in terms of black and white government spending, taxation, and one party is, uh, you know, generally more flexible with increasing taxes, and the other party, just as a dogmatic position, is generally in favor of lower government spending, even if they don't actually enact that, even if their policies are actually different once they get into office. Um, but that's, you know, the standard issue talking points of both the parties. So I think that's certainly hardened. I think it's a negotiation. Um, you know, they'll probably meet in the middle somewhere. But I think as a, a reactionary position, people are generally against this infrastructure spending on the Republican side and very pro uh, this policy on the, on the Democratic side. On the other hand, I will tell you, I mean, still, we covered this earlier. The, um, 
the overall infrastructure plan still needs a giant vision in America for people to really buy into it, and I think that still is lacking. You know, it seems like a, a large uh, hodgepodge of programs where there's not a real cohesive vision for what, um, what America is going to get at the end of it. When you say it, leads, it needs rather a bigger vision, um, are these bills too small then? I don't think they're too small, but they all seem like maintenance projects. When you say we're going to rebuild ports and roads and airports, you know, we've already had ports and roads and airports, you know, so what are we going to do, make them a little bit more brand new? I mean, that seems like a maintenance project. You know, the, the real vision would be, okay, there are going to be trains that run 250 miles an hour. We're going to put a man on the moon, things like that. Those are the broad-based big plans where you're going to show us something new that's never been done before that can only be done with the government as a catalyst for spending. And that, I think, is what I mean by vision. I don't mean, if you can imagine it, you know, there's not enough of a vision that's being sold. So. I think that there are some fundamental possibilities for new things. Um, you know, the Transcontinental Railroad, you know, when that came about, you know, that's something that's new that, that had never happened before. You didn't have the continent, um, you know, uh, continent to continent, ocean to ocean, be able to be transversed by rail. So that's a new big thing. So here, you know, what is the next big thing that we're going to get with all of the spending? And I think if we were to be able to tell us a story and sell a story to the American people, I think that it could be exciting. But as at this point, you know, it's a lot of things that people already understand. Okay, more for social programs, more for roads, more for airports. But what is that big thing that's going to be a very big catalyst? Right, but that's going to cost money. And if we look at the bills right now, 3.5 trillion on this reconciliation bill, 1.2 trillion on the infrastructure bill. Uh, there's going to be negotiations. There will be compromises. We could see that being reduced to probably two trillion dollars, uh, and this is over ten years. So we're talking uh, basically, you know, not a lot of money each year. Uh, we've looked at previous bills. They've been a lot more. So what can this kind of money achieve? You know, I think I think on the on the grand scale of things, I mean, this is a a, a twenty trillion dollar plus economy. So when you're looking at two hundred billion dollars or three hundred billion dollars for infrastructure, things like that over uh, a 10-year period, two, 200 to $300 billion a year, it's not very significant. I mean, this is not, you know, we're looking at revitalizing the United States to uh, regain our competitive position in the world and to not necessarily be a, a nation in decline, because sometimes it does appear like that. And I think the American people sense that. You know, one only needs to go from Kennedy Airport um, to the United Nations headquarters, and you know that U.S. infrastructure is declining. You know, you don't need to see any more visual evidence than that. You know, the, so I think that it does need to be bigger. And we've seen much, much bigger packages, um, you know, during financial bailouts. We've seen much bigger uh, aspects of spending, obviously, during the two wars in the Middle East. So at, at that scale, but I think to some degree, the American people have a right to be skeptical because they have not seen government be overwhelmingly competent over the past 20 years. So I think that that buy-in has not been there. A nation in decline, that's a view of many people. Uh, and a lot of people see these two bills, which are sitting in Congress right now, as a reversal of four or five decades of neoliberal policies. And if we look at those neoliberal policies now, it's resulted in vast inequality, income inequality, wealth inequality, erosion of worker rights. I mean, if we just look at some basic metrics, infant mortality is higher in Texas than it is in Iran. Life expectancy is higher than Saudi Arabia than it is in West Virginia. Um, to what extent will these bills fix that, correct that, perhaps move it in another direction? Well, that's, uh, I mean, I, th I think that's a lot of pressure to put on one bill. But I think as a nation overall, I think to some degree we've had a tremendous period of dysfunction. We've enjoyed this post-war prosperity for a long time, and, and it just ended up hardening. Uh, into a lot of policies that we haven't quite revisited. I mean, for instance, until Trump came into office, we didn't want to revisit uh, tariffs. You know, the, the free trade orthodoxy was a part of both parties' platforms, that trade was generally beneficial for both countries, any two trading partners, and that certainly is not the, the view anymore, not even by uh, conventional economists. So, you know, to some degree, the political moment and the political ground has shifted even the past four years, past 10 years, uh, quite dramatically. We have not, uh, you know, the, the, the emergence of China certainly has been a catalyst for that. But at the same time, uh, you know, we're coming to, 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 to grips with the evidence that's on the ground that the American people are not very happy right now, that they're not very optimistic about the future. Um, and, and it certainly can be turned around, uh, but it needs collective buy-in and not ongoing political dysfunction. And I think that's the, the scary thing, and that's a very big question mark.
To what extent is ideology, to a large extent, responsible for what we are seeing right now? Ideology and the dogma that you talk about, you know, politicians are very fond of throwing around labels. You know, the, the right wing, the Republican Party, uh, loves describing this as left wing, as socialist, as radical. Uh, but doesn't the state have a role in the well-being of people, in the well-being of the country's economy? It, it, it always has, and not only that, it's always been a very big catalyst. So if you can look at things like, you know, um, the steamboat being able to go traverse upriver, you know, that, that had never happened before. So before that, it was only animal power, wind power, or sail power um, that could aid human travel. And until the steam engine, uh, was able to become a commercial boating application, you couldn't traverse that. And that happened with huge government subsidies and uh, with government monopoly grants to be a catalyst for investment. We've seen that with the, uh, with the telegraph. You know, the telegraph, Samuel Morse needed a $30,000 grant from the U.S. Congress to basically be able to implement 200 miles of wire for uh, uh, the first telegraph line that was commercially viable. So this has happened throughout uh, American history, the Transcontinental Railroad. Mm -hmm. You know, you can look in 1890, the 11th annual, 11th 10-year census, and that was the first implementation of punch cards to be able to keep track of 62.5 million uh, punch cards for every American as a part of the census calculations. And that was a huge catalyst for what would become modern computing. Right. So always, so it's, it's not merely to ameliorate social inequalities, uh, but it's also been a catalyst for, uh, for productivity and economic growth. It's been a platform of sorts. Boo, I've just got a little bit of time left, but one final question, and that is if we look at the vast in inequalities in the United States right now, much is being made of that. Uh, I mean, one of the sort of comparisons we hear most often is that the three richest people in the country have more money than the bottom 50% of the country's population. You've written the book on U.S. capitalism, Americana, 400 years of U.S. capitalism. When you look at this, that metric that I just gave you, has capitalism failed? No, I don't think it has failed, but I think it has a role, and I think government has a role, and one is not a substitute for the other. You know, I was thinking about this uh, earlier today, and, you know, you can look at, you know, religion, traditional religion and pop culture. You know, they're two different aspects of of human behavior, and they're both needed. One is not a substitute for the other. Same thing with capitalism and democracy. You know, one cannot, and, and government policy, one is not a substitute for the other. There are certain types of things that you need government spending to do, and there are other things that are best left to the market to figure out, you know, the creativity, the entrepreneurial energy. Those things are very important. That's what gives a nation its vitality. But at the same time, I think government should always be seen as uh, the entity that infuses democratic uh, ideals to set the trajectory for a nation. And for that, you need vision. It just always cannot be done in sound bites between the two parties. Uh, you know, nuance is complicated. Economies are complicated. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's the thing that uh, the American people need to come to terms with um, as we move this country forward. Bruce Srinivasan, thanks so much for joining us. And that's where we have to leave it. I'm Arnand Naidu. Thanks for watching.